Hello and welcome to this episode of Felonious, a podcast where we discuss the realm of true crime. From chilling cold cases to the wild and wacky, we'll explore it all with a perfect blend of seriousness and humour. My name is Emma and I'm Nazia. To keep up to date with what's coming up, be sure to follow us on Instagram at felonious.pod and visit our website feloniouspod.com. We hope you enjoy this episode, so let's get to it. My finds for this week are quite funny. I've got two finds, and they're both from the Metro. So the first one uh, was published this year uh, on January the 2nd, and the title is Vigilante Disguised as Policeman Put Blue Lights on His Van to Stop Speeders. This guy would routinely pull over drivers for traffic offences while he was posing as a police officer and he could face jail for it. He put a blue strobe light on his dashboard of his white Vauxhall van and flashed it when he saw people speeding or breaking other road laws. Right. So what then, would he pocket the fine? What's the point? (laughs) (laughs) I think he just wanted a safer neighbourhood. But he was, he was actually a volunteer special constable in 1996, but quit after a few months. But we don't know why. Yeah. And um, he, he, he claimed in court that he swore an oath to the Crown, um, which still bound him 27 years later. Oh, my God. Really? He got found out because a motorist that he had stopped was suspicious of him. Mm. And he he was stopped because his license plate was partially hidden. Right. And um, a real traffic officer became aware of of uh, this this guy pretending to be a police officer, and so he found him and took all of the items out of his van, included in the strobe light. And he was asked to go to a voluntary interview at a later date. Despite being under investigation, he kept on stopping drivers and was caught out again this time by a genuine volunteer constable. He's just a very bored man. Yeah. Maybe he does want a safer neighbourhood and he's fed up of actual officers and volunteers not doing their job, but then a lot of them aren't doing a lot of things that they're supposed to be doing. No, but you can't pose as a police officer. No. Ask him for trouble. The newspaper crosswords aren't good enough, apparently. (laughs) Yeah, especially the Metro ones. Yeah. Oh, dear. Uh, The next one's hilarious. So this was in the US. The vigilante policeman was in um, Dorset in the UK. This one is, a woman comes home to find someone has stolen her entire driveway. She was trying to sell her house and returned home one day to discover that her entire driveway had been stolen. She got an alert through her Ring doorbell app and was shocked to see a bulldozer ripping up the the concrete of her driveway. What? How and why? I don't know. It It happened not long after she put the house on the market and she had an offer accepted on another property, which was... It was going to be a forever home. Yeah. <laughs> so the police think she's a victim of a scam, but they're not quite sure exactly what the scam is. So I've got a very confused look on my face. What? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently some unsolicited contractors turned up at uh, her house a week before this happened to measure her driveway. And um, Okay. The woman confronted one of them who claimed a man named Andre had hired them to find out how much it would cost to replace the driveway. Uh, f- <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I, yeah. <laughs> so the contractor asked to meet up with this Andre, but Andre told the contractor that he was out of town. Okay. He cut the contractor off when he asked for proof of address, uh, yeah. proof that he owned the house. So why would you then go ahead and bulldoze someone's driveway? <laughs> yeah, if, <laughs> if they haven't given you that proof of address. Surely that's a red flag. <laughs> like, that's basic business, isn't it? And, oh, and all, oh, I don't know, I don't, I, there's too many questions. 
Poor lady. The, the woman spoke to the police who spoke to the contractors and apparently they said it was a mistake and they got the address wrong. Nothing else will happen again. Yeah. Well, you can only bulldoze the driveway once. That's <laughs> insane. Oh, poor lady. I was like, when I saw the title of the article, first of all, I was just like, how the fuck do you steal a driveway? I mean, technically, they didn't steal it. They just destroyed it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, t- what, is there to, what is there to steal? Well, they took the whole, like, tarmac away. There's just mud and yeah. dirt there now. Oh, dear. Uh, only Good in America. America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Snap. <laughs> Oh, right. Uh, but today's episode is a uh, is quite a bizarre one as well. It's quite a sad one. I th- it's it's bizarre, but it's also a bit sad. Yeah, I found that. Yeah, yeah, I, I found it was sad as well. We'll find out why. Yeah, because today we're going to discuss Lillian Betancourt, who was a French socialite businesswoman and Queen of L'Oreal as one of their main shareholders. She was the richest woman in the world, and where there's money, there's controversy. She dodged taxes, gave way too much money to politicians, and her family were once Nazi supporters. So get ready for an engaging episode, because you're worth it. (laughs) Is it L'Oreal that's... Oh yeah, it is you're yeah. worth it, isn't it? Yeah. And the other one, I'm worth it. Maybe, maybe she's born with it. Maybe, maybe it's Maybelline. Maybelline. <laughs> I mean, they're both terrible companies, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be mentioning big sums of money, a lot, a lot of moolah. Yeah. A lot of fraud, a lot of financial abuse, and discussions around politics, including the Nazi regime and anti-Semitism. There would be mentions of dementia and Alzheimer's and of suicide. And there's going to be a lot of French mispronunciations on my part, I'm afraid. Uh, Maybe on my part too, but (laughs) but we'll see. (laughs) So, who is Lillian Betancourt? So Lillian Betancourt was the wealthiest woman in the world and the main shareholder of L'Oreal. She had 160 million euros in the bank to fund her lifestyle for 10 years. She was also expecting dividends of 175 million euros. Patrice Demetre was the asset manager and his job was to manage the money earned from L'Oreal and make a profit with it. He and Lillian met in 2003. When they met, Lillian was worth around 30 billion euros. L'Oreal were making a profit at the time and since Lillian and her family were the main shareholders, they got a substantial amount of the company's profits. L'Oreal was founded by Lillian's father, Eugene Schuller. Eugene was born in 1881 to parents who ran a patisserie in Montparnasse. He had a successful academic career, graduating in 1904 as a scientist. He worked as a teacher until a hairdresser approached him asking for a better formula for hair dye than the ones that were being used at the time. He quit his teaching job and converted his apartment into a laboratory. He perfected his formula in a few years and started selling his product to hairdressers, and eventually L'Oreal was founded. Lillian worshipped her father. Her mother died when she was five, and she would apparently get jealous when her father paid other women attention. Lillian had a mansion in Neuilly, which employed 20 permanent staff, organised like a feudal system, but everyone had respect for the boss. The employees were paid very well and always by cash. Although she was rich beyond belief, she was not a happy woman. She was married for 50 years to her husband, André Betancourt. George Kiegeman, Lillian's lawyer, said she was a very charming woman, but she rarely had a chance to show it. André Betancourt was a minister under de Gaulle and Pompidou. Whenever he would travel for work, Lillian would follow him like the doting wife and fulfilled her responsibilities. He funded his political career with Lillian's money. Lillian was a beautiful, stylish woman and André was proud of her. 
Do you know what? I thought she looks a bit like Amy Winehouse. Did you think that? Sorry, mm, bit of a tangent. No. Oh, she had a bit of Amy Winehouse look about her when she was in her youth. Just, yeah, I'm just trying to remember. Obviously, she didn't have the beehive hair and the <laughs> yeah, that's probably massive, why. <laughs> uh, massive eyeliner. <laughs> and loads of tattoos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but her facial structure, um, I think it was her eyes and her jawline just really reminded me of um, Amy Winehouse. Mm, anyway. But yeah, she was beautiful. Despite this, he was not very affectionate towards Lillian and was very distant during their marriage. He apparently had no interest in women. They each had their own personal life. They also had separate bedrooms and only had one child, Francoise. Because of her marriage, Lillian suffered bouts of depression. Then she met photographer Francois Marie Bagnier. Bagnier had an excessive personality which brightened Lillian's solitary life. The pair had previously met in 1969 at a dinner party and again at a number of social events, but it was in 1987 when their relationship really kicked off. Bannier was then commissioned to photograph Lillian for the magazine Egoist. Bannier was used to photographing high society and he knew how to charm his subjects. He built a relationship with Lillian and chose what she would wear in the photos. His presence was chaotic in the house for the employees and he came across as very rude. The staff at the mansion were shocked with how he would piss on the roses and leave his motorbike in the garden. But his outrageousness was something new and exciting for Lillian compared to her stale marriage. He made her laugh and he was very different compared to her husband. Bagnier was born into a bourgeois family. His father was a very successful advertising executive, but he had a very unhappy childhood. His father used to beat him and his mother was very distant. He was so unhappy that he tried to commit suicide when he was 15 years old. According to a Vanity Fair article, in his mid-teens, Bagnier would spend time with Salvador Dali, who would send his car for Bagnier every day. Bagnier apparently coined the names for perfumes for Dior and Yves Saint Laurent. He even appeared in the 1997 film The Brave alongside Marlon Brando and Johnny Depp. Lillian's daughter, Francoise Betancourt Meyers, found Bagnier to be vulgar and couldn't understand why her mother liked him. Francoise wrote in a document that her mother initially refused to give money to Bagnier. Lillian didn't have a loving relationship with her daughter. She described her daughter as clumsy, slow and not as radiant, dynamic, ambitious or curious enough. Francoise was an introvert and didn't like social events. Lillian didn't want to support her daughter all her life and she was worried about her daughter taking over L'Oreal. Bagnier is the opposite to Francoise as he likes to party and socialise in high society. He introduced Lillian to interesting people like actors, artists and writers. He took her to art exhibitions and encouraged her to buy certain pieces and they also discussed literature. They started to travel together and it was very exciting for Lillian as she could finally be herself. They communicated regularly by fax for years and the relationship became a romantic friendship. Bagnier was openly gay, but Lillian admitted that she could have married him. André Betancourt, Lillian's husband, even saw their friendship as a positive thing because Lillian was no longer sad and depressed. And maybe he felt more comfortable having someone more gay around his wife than himself. Yeah, Oh, yeah, I hadn't but, thought of that, actually. That's just, I thought that, I mean, I'm just speculating, obviously, but maybe. I, I also found it strange how he had a relationship with Salvador Dali. He was quite close to him. He would send his car every day to collect Bernier from the hotel. Uh, or to, yeah. to go to Salvador Dali's hotel. I wonder what that was about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, just speculating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, around 1992, Francoise became jealous of Lillian's relationship with Barnier, who was getting her mother's interest and affections. The inequalities in Lillian and Barnier's friendship started to show. Lillian would pay for the restaurant bills and holidays, for example. Barnier encouraged her to buy very expensive pieces of art which she would sometimes give to Bania as a token of their friendship. Compared to her considerable wealth, these were but small gifts. 
By 1997, Francois started to worry about these gifts and she became suspicious. Lillian's asset manager also became concerned over the excessive gifts given to Vanier, who didn't refuse any of them. The house staff were growing concerned about Bunia asking for lots of money and with his constant presence in the house. Lillian's secretary mentioned that Bunia would tell her to make sure Lillian had her checkbook in her purse. The secretary noticed there were checks missing of hundreds of thousands of euros and Lillian's asset manager was never involved with the gifts she gave to Bunia. The asset manager heard about it from Lillian's accountant, Claire Thibault, who worked with Lillian for 14 years. Bania would call Claire at home and ask for money. He asked for 3 million euros at one point. Bania kept asking Claire to empty one of Lillian's BNP bank vaults, where she kept her jewellery. Lillian would only wear her diamonds on special occasions, and Claire was the one to retrieve them from the vault. One day Lillian herself asked Claire to take all of the jewellery out of the vault and Claire felt uneasy about this as she knew it was a request from Bunier through Lillian. But she was Lillian's employee so she had no choice. Lillian's asset manager warned her not to give her jewellery to Bunier. The accountant Claire visited Lillian's daughter Françoise and told her everything about Bunier trying to get a hold of the jewellery and how much money he had been given. From 1997 to 2007, the amount the gifts to Bannier equated to 917 million euros, nearly 1 billion euros. André Betancourt died at 80 years old in 2007. Bannier was present at his funeral, and three weeks later, the housemaid in the mansion overheard a shocking conversation between Lillian and Bannier, in which he asked her to adopt him. It would make him an official heir, and he would have a right to inheritance. He did this at a time when Lillian was sad and confused after losing her husband of 50 years. Claire Thibault, the accountant, passed this information on to Françoise. Lillian's asset manager warned that it would start a war within the family if she passed on everything to Bernier. Françoise wrote a letter to her mother to say that she would file a lawsuit as she couldn't stand by while Bania was trying to take advantage of Lillian. Lillian saw this as a conflict between her and her daughter, rather than between Françoise and Bania. Lillian wrote a letter to her daughter threatening to take back gifts given to Françoise due to her ingratitude. She also threatened that half of her inheritance would go to the state or to charities. The lawsuit went ahead and the atmosphere in the house changed completely. Françoise asked employees to make testimonies and statements about Bernier taking advantage of her mother and abusing her wealth. And it worked as the staff despised Bernier. Lillian was notified about who was going to testify and that Bernier was not who she thought he was. The house staff said that Bernier described Lillian's grandchildren as little shits. There was tension in the house between the staff and Lillian. Bernier put suspicions on some of the staff and encouraged Lillian to fire some of them he didn't trust, and she did. Lillian's asset manager brought in private security firms to search the house for microphones. He suspected that the phone lines were tapped, but nothing was ever found. Pascal Bonifoy, Lillian's butler, was under suspicion. He didn't like Bannier and he wanted to get proof of how he was scamming Lillian. Pascal recorded conversations between Lillian and Bannier, but also discussions with her asset manager. And remember the asset manager had no idea about the recording and he was the one that organised the security service to sweep the house for bugs. It's quite funny, isn't it? Yeah. They talked about bank accounts in Geneva, which held 65 million euros. A transfer to another country was being organised by the asset manager to either Hong Kong, Singapore or Uruguay, as the French authorities could legally check if the family had money in Switzerland. But the family had not declared these accounts, which is illegal. 
This was tax evasion, and the media found out about it. Pascal the butler was scared that he would get caught recording Lillian's conversations, but it turned out to be quite easy for him. He left the dictaphone on the tray of food and drinks he brought into the room. Pascal took the recordings to his lawyer, Anton Guillot, and decided to give the recordings to Lillian's daughter, Françoise betancourt Mayers. Françoise documented their meeting. She asked why Pascal made the recordings and he said that he felt attacked by Bannier and threatened to have him fired. Pascal made recordings for a year in which some proved that Lillian was being abused financially. Even though a lot of the recordings revealed the inner workings of the family and the shortcuts taken financially, like the tax evading, Françoise took the recordings to the press because she wanted to get rid of Bernier. She also took the recordings to the Financial Crime Squad in 2010. Philippe Correa, the lead prosecutor in the lawsuit, didn't have time to listen to the recordings before they were published by Mediapart and Le Point. Le Point. Le, oh, damn it, I thought I got it right. <laughs> Close. <laughs> The press were more interested by the tax evasion than by Lillian's relationship with Barnier. The asset manager arranged for the money in Switzerland to be transferred to Singapore because of the strict banking privacy laws. There was 108 million euros of unpaid taxes. In the recordings, Lillian admitted that moving the money like this makes her feel guilty, but the asset manager said, it's a good problem to have. Although he knew of three accounts in Switzerland, he knew nothing about the other 15 or 20 accounts. He says that Lillian should have paid wealth tax on the money in Switzerland, but he didn't take it upon himself to go to the authorities and report the family. The recordings also uncovered that the family had an island in the Seychelles, which the asset manager advised not to disclose. The island was hidden from the French tax authorities through foundations in Liechtenstein. Even though the asset manager had been to the island several times, he didn't know how Lillian brought the island, but he guessed through the money in Switzerland. The recordings took the focus of Barnier, as there were only two occasions when he can be heard talking. Barnier would usually meet Lillian in her bedroom, and not the living room where the recordings took place. A number of politicians are named in the recordings, Eric Wirth, the budget minister at the time, who took care of Lillian's taxes and was also a friend of the asset manager. Wirth was also responsible for pursuing tax dodges. The asset manager said in the documentary on Netflix, I was using the term loosely. He was never a friend, but he had interactions that I would classify as friendly. The asset manager denies speaking to Eric Wirth about the family's taxes. Large fortunes in France are usually audited by the tax authority every three years. Lillian had not been audited at all. Her accountant, Claire Thibault, gave evidence to the media about the family's finances. She even knew the tax inspector in Neuilly. She also then claimed that Wirth and Nicolas Sarkozy were paid off which of course they denied. Claire Thibault said that in March 2007, the asset manager Patrice asked for her to take out €150,000, but she refused to do it. She was only allowed to withdraw 50000 at a time. Claire asked Patrice what it was for, and he said it was to pay Minister Worth for Sarkozy's election campaign. Worth was the treasurer for the Sarkozy's campaign in 2007. It is illegal in France to give more than €7,500 for a political campaign. However, Claire Thibault withdrew the 50000 to give to Lillian, which she gave to the asset manager. As this was not enough, more money was withdrawn from Switzerland. Sarkozy's election campaign was now looking very dodgy, especially as it led to his election as president. The asset manager says that it's all bullshit and there is no evidence to say that Claire Thibault gave 50000 to Lillian to give to him. He claims he never gave Minister Worth the 50000 Claire mentioned that politicians would come to the house to collect their money and that all of the staff knew Sarkozy was there. 
There was chaos in Sarkozy's government and protests were being held in the country about the unfairness of wealth. Lillian did an interview at her vacation home in Brittany. She had no memory of giving money to Sarkozy's campaign and didn't believe the accusations. Worth said that he never received money from the Betancourts and that Sarkozy was being targeted. Worth then resigned in 2010 and said that he was a victim of a witch hunt by the left after he planned to raise the pension age from 60 to 62. Philippe Courier, the prosecutor, sent officers to question the accountant, Claire Taboo. They interrogated her and treated her as though she was a criminal. They wanted her to retract her statement. She went through her statements a number of times, with some inconsistencies. She said she withdrew the money at the bank and then changed it to the safe because it was full. There were errors with dates and complicated details. Then she said that she never said the things Media Park claimed. She did see Sarkozy at the Betancourt's home and she did hand money to the Betancourt's, but she never linked the two and said that it was made up by Media Park. She retracted the statements she made about Sarkozy. She knew that there was money circulating, but she didn't know where the money was going. However, she has since said that she was put under extreme pressure to change her statement. And Sarkozy gives uh, a TV interview in the Netflix documentary, and he's asked about uh, this scandal to do with the politician's money. Mm. And he, he says to the interviewer, do you see me getting invited to dinner and leaving with money? I was thinking, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, I, I see you doing exactly yeah. that. <laughs> you seem like the person that would do that. Yeah. And also, if the accountant's like being interrogated, of course, her statements are going to change over time. Like, it's a very stressful situation and she's dealing with some very powerful people. Yeah, and memory, you know, it's not great at the, the best of times, is it? You get things yeah. wrong. It's just. And speaking of memory, that clip of Lillian on uh, doing her interview from Brittany, she just looks so fragile and you can tell she's not all there. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a few instances where that becomes apparent. Yeah, it's a bit like Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah. Except he's running a whole fucking country, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Lillian had known Sarkozy for a number of years, since he was a young boy. He was mayor of Neuilly, where the Betancourts lived, and he was invited to dinner parties at the Betancourts mansion. Lillian even refers to Sarkozy as her sweetheart in one of the recordings. There is a recording where the asset manager says that Sarkozy got the prosecutor, Kuroye, oh my god, now I've, even I'm fucking up on it, I'm too tired Kuroye. for this. Kuroye. <laughs> It's, it's like a weird pronunciation of courier. Yeah, can we just call him Philippe? <laughs> yeah, we're on first name basis here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll try again. <laughs> there is a recording where the asset manager says that Sarkozy got the prosecutor Philippe Courier to declare that her daughter's lawsuit evidence was inadmissible. Philippe denies this. There is a long history of the Betancourt family funding politics, left, right and centre. The founder of L'Oreal, Eugene Schiller, Lillian's father, was originally interested in the far-right ideology. There are documents to show that L'Oreal sent shipments to the Germans during the occupation. It is believed that Eugene financed the far-right anti-communist underground organisation called La Cagoule, which executed Italian anti-fascists in Paris. There were many in France's economic elite who worked with the Nazi regime. Eugene also helped set up the revolutionary social movement, which was opposed to Judaism and the Freemasons. It was through these organisations that he met Lillian's future husband, André. In 1941, Eugene wrote for the German propaganda magazine La Terre Française, The French Land, and helped propel anti-Semitism as it served the collectivity. However, in 1944, Eugene joined the resistance and allegedly saved the lives of Jews. He was awarded the Legion d'Honneur and dodged convictions for his collaboration with the Nazis by the help of André Betancourt. 
So yeah, leading up to the Second World War, he Eugene was one of the biggest backers of the far-right leader in France called Eugene, another Eugene, Deloncle. And during the war, Deloncle formed the political party, which was in favour of working with the Nazis. And seven synagogues were blown up by this party. And the revolutionary social movement, they even had their office set up in the L'Oreal headquarters. However, it has been argued that Eugene Schuler was not actually anti-Semitic. He just thought he was making a smart business decision and then changed his allegiance when the tide of the war was turning. It sounds like some of the members of the royal family to me. Yeah, yeah. And today, L'Oreal is one of the many large companies profiting from Israel's occupation in Palestine. And its largest headquarters in the Middle East is in Israel and takes resources for its products from the Dead Sea, which, you know, I mean, obviously with leadership of companies, political ideologies can change, but it's all about money at the end of the day, regardless of who suffers as a consequence. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that about the Dead Sea. I also didn't know about the, you know, they were Nazi sympathisers. Yeah. So, yeah, it's quite shocking. I really want to research more into L'Oreal and more into the products I buy in general. Yeah. I mean, I I haven't bought L'Oreal products for a long time because I don't think they're cruelty-free. They're definitely not vegan. But, yeah, a lot of these big companies, they're just... There's some sort of corruption. And side note, I'm really sorry if you can hear my cat using the litter box in the background. (laughs) Well, he's got to go, he's got to go. (laughs) Now's a good time to do a poo. (laughs) (laughs) It's all that Nazi Nazi talk, it stinks. (laughs) Yeah. (sighs) But yeah, um, don't buy L'Oreal. There's better products out there. That's better for the planet. On a side note, I did see a vegan blog post this week. Um, Yeah. I was looking for vegan hair products and it listed um, a L'Oreal product on there. Okay. But I can't remember what the product was called. It's not Garnier. Is Garnier part of L'Oreal? Because I've seen some, some, I think bigger brands are starting to advertise themselves as vegan because they know that's going to get them money. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? uh, Yeah, that makes sense. it's more of a marketing thing. Yeah. But yeah, oh, that's interesting. But yeah, still, avoid it if you can. Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying, you know, to balance the... <laughs> so we don't get in trouble. <laughs> not not like anyone's serious is going to... I mean, you're all serious listeners, but... Yeah, I don't think any of the betting courts are going to listen to this. No. <laughs> So Lillian always claimed that her father wouldn't have willingly given money to the Nazis and refused to believe that he was anti-Semitic. However, in the recordings, it is hinted that Lillian inherited her father's political beliefs. For example, when she speaks about her grandson, she asked the asset manager to confirm that he didn't look too Jewish, which I thought was was quite funny because she's like, "Didn't didn't she say something like, oh... Is he still handsome, but not too Jewish looking yeah. or something like that? <laughs> it's like, how can you look Jewish? I mean... Yeah, because um, her daughter, Francoise, married a, a Jewish man. I can't remember his name. Yeah, but I guess not like justifying those comments, but it's probably like a, I don't want to say cultural thing, but back then people probably made, co- you know... There was a lot of propaganda about Jewish people. And if she was growing up at some point, yeah, you know, in, it, it's very hard to get rid of that. I don't know even, don't, don't know the word to say, but she's an old lady. Racism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it, it's a unconscious bias, yeah. isn't it? But not that unconscious because she's saying it anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> Go, going back to Francoise, her, uh, yeah. Lillian's daughter. I read in a, a couple of articles that one of the reasons why she married her Jewish husband was to rebel against like the family right ideology. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah. 
And maybe that would have created more of a rift between mother and daughter as well. Mm. So in 2004, Monica Walzfelder accused L'Oreal of receiving stolen goods from the Nazis who illegally took possession of her Jewish family home during the war. However, there was no comment from Lillian or L'Oreal. Then there is a recording which brings to light Francoise's suspicions that people around her mother were taking advantage. The asset manager slyly asked for a boat for 1.2 million euros, but the money had to come from Switzerland and he didn't want anyone to know because he signed a document to say that he was Lillian's protector. The asset manager said it was media hype because the boat was never purchased. He's a funny one, that guy. He's so dodgy. Yeah. The asset manager said that Lillian had seen a picture of his boat on his computer and he mentioned that he was planning on getting a new one. Lillian said that she would be happy to help him buy the boat. He decided not to take her up on her offer and didn't buy the new boat. He didn't feel, as her employee, that it was appropriate to receive such a gift. Or he didn't know how to explain it, if anyone asked about it. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a bit of a numpty. The staff in the house started asking Lillian for more money, not just in terms of salary, but of property. Her bodyguard and nurse were gifted apartments. Lindsay Owen-Jones, the L'Oreal chairman, received 100 million euros. Francoise couldn't bear to see her mother being taken advantage of in this way. She even tried to prove that Lillian was not in her right mind. She asked for her mother to be placed under a guardianship, but Lillian didn't want this. Francoise wanted her mother to undergo MRIs and psychiatric assessments. Lillian's asset manager and other close employees said that she could refuse the assessments and that they couldn't be sure if the expert had been bribed by Francoise. The judge, however, ordered the tests for Lillian, which showed that she had difficulty with communication, comprehension and hearing. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. There are many recordings that illustrate her confusion. She doesn't know who some people are, where her property is and has difficulty following instructions. So could that mean that everyone around her took advantage of her? There is a conversation between her and her lawyer in which she asked about what percentage Banya has in her will. When she is told that he is the sole beneficiary, she is surprised and asks the lawyer who made this decision, to which he replied that she did. She also couldn't remember giving the island in the Seychelles to Banya. Her asset manager says in the documentary, Mrs. Betancourt was an elderly woman and she sometimes felt tired and had memory lapses. That absolutely doesn't mean that she was no longer capable of reasoning and making decisions. In no way did I take advantage of Mrs. Betancourt's vulnerability. In 2010, Lillian reconciled with her daughter Francoise. They both decided to drop all charges. Francoise made her mother sign an agreement after stating that she couldn't make her own decisions, which were very contradictory. Lillian's lawyer had no idea about the agreement, which went against what Lillian wanted to avoid. The guardianship was in place and Francoise and her children took control of the family assets. It is unclear how Francoise got her mother to sign the agreement. There is speculation that she took advantage of her mother's mental health like Bannier and other people had been accused of. The asset manager was ordered to step down from his position to be replaced by Francoise's husband. Most of the staff were replaced by those chosen by Lillian's grandson, including her doctor. She was no longer able to contact her lawyer. Her family took Lillian to Dubai and she no longer had contact with her friends, including Banier. In February 2012, Worth was investigated for influencing peddling and securing France's highest award, the Légion d'Honneur, for Patrice de Maitre. Another issue was that his wife, Florence Worth, was Lillian's investment advisor. She was employed by Patrice de Maitre, but resigned in 2010. Apparently, Patrice says in the recordings that he gave the job to Mrs. Worth because her husband asked him to. And um, perhaps that's why he got the Legion d'Honneur. Who knows? Who knows? In March 2012, the courts continued their investigations into the cash payments to certain politicians and the involvement of Worth and Sarkozy. Patrice, the asset manager, was taken into custody. 
They questioned him about his involvement in giving money to Worth and Sarkozy, but he denied all allegations. He spent 88 days in prison and posted a bail of 4 million euros. Sarkozy was running for a second term as president, but he lost to Hollande, and he lost his presidential immunity and was indicted by the courts. The only piece of evidence that links Sarkozy to the Betancourt money is a note made in Bunia's diary, alluding to something Lillian had told him. She had said that Patrice, the asset manager, said that Sarkozy was asking for money again, and Lillian had said yes. So they were unable to charge Sarkozy with so little evidence. The trials of 10 people accused of trying to defraud Lillian Betancourt were about to begin. Barnier and Patrice were included. In January 2015, Francois's goal from 2007 was to get Barnier convicted. Lillian was not at the trial. She was 92 and the court was debating whether she was showing signs of dementia. In 2015, it was confirmed that she had Alzheimer's. The trial was postponed due to the suicide attempt of Lillian's night nurse. 64-year-old Alain Turin, who was one of the defendants in the trial. Claire Thibault, the accountant, failed to appear in court due to health issues. Another defendant was Carlos Casino Vellerano, who looked after the Seychelles Island and was accused of pocketing €2 million. Euros. The judge questioned Bannier about the gifts he had received, which started in 2006 when Lillian's health started to deteriorate. He was the sole inheritor in her will and the beneficiary of a life insurance policy worth 262 million euros. Bania acted like he didn't care about money, stating he didn't know how much he had. The judge questioned him about the life insurance policy and he said that he refused at first at being the sole beneficiary, but it was what Lillian wanted. Through the trial, it was uncovered that in 1969, Barnier had a relationship with another high-profile rich older woman, Madeleine Castang, who was an antiques dealer and interior designer. She was known as the interior design diva in France. Barnier was often at Madeleine's house and he wanted her to give him paintings. Her health was getting worse and Barnier took a share of her fortune. Madeleine's grandson became very concerned with her relationship with Bunier, claiming that he acted like a gigolo around Madeleine and even pushed her down the stairs on one occasion. Bunier in turn sued her grandson for slander, but it never came to anything. Bunier also received gifts from the singer Vanessa Paradis and fashion designer Dion von Furstenberg. He won the affections of Sal Schlimberger wife of an oil industry magnate, who offered to purchase him an apartment and give him a monthly income so he could follow his artistic endeavours. Bunia was sentenced to two and a half years in prison and had to pay a fine of €350,000 and damages of €158 million. The property given to him was confiscated and his name was taken away from the life insurance policies. He accused Francoise Betancourt Mayers of bribing witnesses to give evidence against him. He said that Claire Thibault was given a loan of €300,000 in 2012 and a further 400000 for her false testimonies. But Francoise's lawyers pointed out that the loan was given after her complaint against Bannier was dropped. Patrice, the asset manager, was also convicted and sentenced to 18 months. He also had to pay a fine and 12 million euros in damages. He says in the documentary that he found his sentence to be unjust. He believes he is a victim in all of this. He said that he appreciated and respected Lillian Betancourt. In 2017, Lillian passed away at the age of 94. But in 2003, four years before the lawsuit, Lillian wrote a letter to her daughter, Francoise, as part of her will. Lillian mentions the immense amount of money that will be passed on to her, 1 billion euros free of taxes. 
She wrote that she wanted the ownership of the island in the Seychelles to be transferred to Bagnères. She also instructed her daughter to give Bagnères half of the 1 billion euros left to her. She reminded Françoise that she would have the mansion and the shares at L'Oréal. She described Bagnères as her best friend for 15 years, which her daughter pushed away. These requests were not carried out following Lillian's death. Bagnères appealed and obtained a retrial and his sentence was significantly reduced and he didn't have to pay the 158 million euros in damages. He, however, had to pay one euro in damages to Françoise betancourt Mayers. Patrice signed a settlement with Françoise to reduce the penalties, and Sarkozy's charges were dismissed. There was a BBC News article in 2023 that said that Françoise betancourt Mayers was the wealthiest woman in the world. Her fortune is estimated to be 90.1 billion euros, but she is the 12th richest person in the world. That's a lot of money. Yeah, so much money. But yeah, the world does not need billionaires. However, at least this story has a roundabout happy ending in that Banier didn't get away with what he probably set out to get away with. And the asset manager, it, it was clearly after something. I mean, if he really appreciated and respected Lillian, he would have stopped a lot of the abuse from happening. And advised better on the tax evasion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah, I mean, it just, this is a case of just top level financial abuse, really, and kind of opens up a whole side of Alzheimer's and dementia that probably isn't spoken enough about, which is how it can make people vulnerable to abuse. So a report was published in 2011 from alzheimers.org.uk, which included results from 104 survey responses from carers of people with dementia. Among the findings, 15% of carers reported that the person they cared for had been subject to some kind of financial abuse. All groups thought that sometimes family and friends could financially abuse people with dementia. They felt this type of abuse was perhaps the most difficult to define and to talk about openly. And according to the World Health Organization, abuse in older people has increased since the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2017, there was a review of 52 studies in 28 countries, which estimated that over the past year, one in six people, so 15.7%, aged over 60 years and older, were subjected to some form of abuse. Out of those, 6.8% were estimated to be financial abuse in community settings reported by older adults and 13.8% in institutional settings and that was reported by older adults and their proxies. Did it say in regards to the abuse of older people like increasing since COVID, did they say why that was? No, or... Maybe I didn't look into it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. I was very tired when I was re researching this. No, but I guess with the pandemic, I feel like, and this is just my view of things, I feel like all kinds of abuse had increased. Mm. You know, domestic abuse. I don't know about child, maybe child abuse. But because like with the lockdowns, people, if they had a bubble and less access to healthcare because of the lockdowns and restrictions, that might have also created an opportunity for abuse to increase. Not saying that there was anything wrong with the lockdowns, but it's just a, a consequence of, you know... I guess people were spending more time with their abusers. Yeah, and it was probably more difficult to report. Yeah. And detect abuse because of the disconnect people had. Mm. But yeah, like, you know, good on Francoise for doing what she had to do. Yeah, for sticking up for her mother. Yeah, and like just watching the, the clips of those interviews uh, of Lillian, it's just quite, it's really sad because you can tell that she's not in her right mind. And like, especially the extracts you hear from the recordings, mm. the secret recordings, like how the asset manager is coaxing her you know, he's leading the... It, it, you can tell it's abuse. Yeah. And there's no way to explain that away. 
Yeah, I felt really sorry for her while I was watching that. And I felt sorry for her again, like being diagnosed with Alzheimer's and then being shipped to Dubai where she was away from everyone, like even the friends that didn't take advantage of her. Yeah, I don't know if that's such a good idea. Because if someone's already confused, why would you take them to a whole other country? Unless she was facing other legal issues, I don't know. Yeah, or maybe they, you know, it was for her own protection just to make sure no one, I mean, who knows. But yeah, at least at the end of the day, Banya and Patrice didn't get what they wanted, especially Banya, especially like if he'd he'd done that before. He's such a snake. Yeah. And, you know, that's, it's like quite narcissistic behaviour, isn't it? He probably feels, you know, he can get away with this behaviour and he's got, almost gotten away with it before and he just he probably felt invincible yeah it seemed like he used his job as an artist as like a an excuse like oh poor little me poor poor artist i know even though he's got a rich family like not really (laughs) yeah yeah well don't know what else to say about that really (laughs) yeah (laughs) i thought i thought the documentary was good though I, i recommend it yeah yeah, no, I mean, when when you first told me about it, I was like, what is this going to be? And then I thought it was going to be, like, to begin with, I thought it was going to be something outrageous. And then it, it was something that was quite just a bit, maybe close to home for me, because, mm. like, I've got family members that are suffering from dementia, or I know people who have family members that ha- have Alzheimer's and dementia, mm. and I've heard the story. So it's quite you know, interesting to see something like that in the spotlight, especially for someone so wealthy, because you forget that wealthy people, you know, they're just humans at the end of the day. And they're just as susceptible Mm. to the diseases and the abuse that comes with it, just as anyone else, really. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you've got loads of money doesn't mean that you're not going to get anything wrong with you. And Yeah. Yeah. And people aren't always going to look out for your best interests. Yeah. And that must have been quite sad for her daughter as well to be put in that situation, especially when, you know, if a parent and a child don't have the best relationship. But despite that, the daughter has her mother's best interests at heart. Mm. And, you know, this this is the fight that she has to put up to protect the legacy of the family. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. That's all right. This is taking a serious turn. <laughs> oh, I have lots of thoughts about the next case. I haven't even looked at this this one, but please tell us what it's about. Yeah, so oh, the next episode we will be looking at Kathleen Folbig, who was an Australian who is an Australian woman, who was wrongfully convicted in 2003 for murdering her four babies. And yeah, this one's a really, really, it's a very, very frustrating one and also really, really depressing. Just what you want on a Tuesday. I know. (laughs) Yeah, after you've had like Monday blues, you've got... Tuesday deeper blues. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. But no, it's, it's it's a really, really interesting case. I did, I don't want to say I enjoyed researching it because it's not a, a, an enjoyable subject but it's really interesting but also really really frustrating you'll find out why yeah join us next week to find out why <laughs> <laughs> follow us and like us on all the podcast platforms you use whether that be spotify amazon music apple podcasts google podcasts antenna i don't think google exists anymore does it uh no but it's youtube youtube whatever it is yeah yeah whatever it is go and listen to us go on do it (laughs) you know you want to see you next tuesday thank you for listening to the show we hope you enjoyed this episode you can find more information about the show on our website at feloniouspod.com or on our Instagram at feloniouspod. Links to our show notes can be found in the episode description, as well as through our website and social media. You can visit our Contact Us page and tell us what you think about the show 
and if there are any cases you would like us to cover. We hope you join us for the next episode. Goodbye. Bye.